Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to another saunter. And today we're on Psalm 104, and it's overcast and it may rain, but who cares? We're having fun. And so let us pray and ask the Lord to help us. Good morning, Hazel. So, Lord Jesus, we open our hearts to you today and ask you to pour in your love and revelation as we look at your word. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Draw close to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Tracy Ann and Wendy. Good morning, Tony. Good to have you with us. Good morning, Joyce. Hey ho. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Good morning, Cecilia. Buenos dias. Morning, Chris. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. Good morning, Ruth and Sandy and John and Joan. You are clothed with splendour and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. Morning, John and Deepak. Stretching out the heavens like a tent, he lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. Good morning, Pat and Sally. Good morning, Tim and Isaac. This is a great psalm. It's particularly good if you're interested in nature and the the created order it's glorious and very poetic and colorful and full-on good morning Julie and it's just describing the greatness of God as evidenced by the creation all around us and Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that creation describes the invisible nature of God it actually is pouring out speech day and night as a testimony to God and his incredible loveliness. Good morning, Helen. And uh, if you're privileged like me to have grown up in the countryside, um, with it all around you, it's even more real um, somehow than, uh, I don't know, it, it's so much part of your life to watch things grow, things be born and the cycle of life when you live in the countryside and in amongst agriculture and so on you do kind of get that feel of the whole process in quite an extraordinary way good morning chris and ruth and so this is a lovely psalm i enjoy it personally um it, but it, it it describes his majesty of god and this is just an interesting thing from the from from the beginning he says oh lord my god you are very great yeah kind of slight understatement there but then we do run out of words with describing god because he is awesome and so far beyond us and good morning pete and good morning gabriel um but it says that he covers himself with light as with a garment now normally we cover things for a reason and and in god if, <laughs> somehow i'm trying to think if if our clothing is less than we are in as much as it's less wonderful i mean it is it can be very wonderful and very beautifully made but it's less wonderful than we are somehow light is kind of less wonderful than god is and yet light is almost the the kind of descriptor of him isn't it he is he lives in unapproachable light and he is in him is light and there is no darkness at all uh, the bible says and you know it's like <laughs> we can't, and yet this is a this is just a clothing that god puts on and i wonder if if it's just some it's a form that we can relate to but also i guess if god is invisible then he has to put on something to make himself visible if you like so then light would be that thing that he puts on to make himself visible to us i don't know i just think about it and it says that he stretches out the heavens like a tent 
And this idea of a tent seems to keep cropping up in the Psalms. Good morning, Emily. And um, let's just real quick do a little tent thing. So the idea of a tent, it's a tabernacle. It's a temporary residence. It's, it's not a permanent thing. We have a beautiful tent we use for camp and stuff like that, but it gets torn when the wind rip, when the wind piles into it like it did last year, and it does untold damage to it because essentially the tent is temporary. It's not a permanent thing. And even our house, we have to have some work done on the roof because it's leaking. Even our house, which is a permanent structure, is still temporary in the sense of everything. So... But it says that God is pitched, stretched out the heavens like a tent. And then we have this sense that David built a tent to house, if you like, if that were even possible, the glory of God. But who can contain him? Do you know what I mean? So he's like built this tent. He's erected this temporary structure in which the glory of God would graciously come and reside. And then we've also got this sense of the Messiah, Jesus, who comes and the, the Apostle John says that he came and tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent among us. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And so we've got this sense that, yeah, God lives in a temporary residence in all kinds of different ways. And yet the tabernacle of David, which this psalm may have been written by David, some people think it was, it, it was like, even as David looks at the skies, he's thinking, wow, you've made that like a tent for your, for your glory to be seen in. And so the skies that kind of cover the earth and create like a tent over the earth, they're the context with which, within which we encounter the glory and awesomeness of God. And Jesus comes in a human tent and he becomes the way we encounter the glory of the living God. David's tent, all how wonderful it was and everything else, was a foreshadowing and a picture of the Messiah who would come. And so just as David's tent was there, you've got to stick with me. I know this is a massive digression, but it's a good one. Good morning, Jack. And, and so David's tent, there it is, wonderful. The presence of God comes and dwells in that place so that human beings can come and encounter God in that place is devoted to worship. How much more the tent of Jesus' body becomes like this place where the glory of God resides and human beings can encounter the glory in the person of Jesus as he tabernacles among us. Is anyone getting there? I think that's a cool thought to start the day with. We could park it there, couldn't we? And then <laughs> do the next verse tomorrow. Um, verse three, it says, he lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He's just like, this is this is God's arena. This is where God is kind of, the, these things that we look at and we think the waters, you couldn't build on the waters and yet God builds his chambers on the waters. No problem. Ch clouds, if you jumped out of an aeroplane and thought, I'm going to make a cloud my chariot, you'd plunge straight through it and come to earth without a chariot <laughs> and probably without a life. That's why we have parachutes. And it's like, whoa. And yet God makes the clouds his chariots. He can gallop around the skies in a chariot made of cloud. How amazing. And he makes the messenger's winds his ministers of flame and fire. Now, Tim, you'll enjoy this one. This is a, a word messenger there is malak, which is the word we translate angels, but it can also be translated messengers. And wind there is also the word ruach, which is the word for spirit. Sounds like you're clear in your throat. Um, <coughs> and... Um, so he's saying he makes his angels or his messengers ruach. They're like breath. They're like wind. And so God has access to a whole array of different resources than what we see around us. So he can do the clouds and he, all that stuff and chariot around the skies in the cloud and all, whatever he wants to do. But his messengers are like breath. 
and this is a really interesting one because I'm sure it's probably speaking about angelic messengers, but if you think of it in terms of human messengers, it works as well. He fills them with his breath, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. Good morning, Mike. And he, the word we have for Holy Spirit, where well, the word for God's spirit is ruach, it's the same as breath, it's the same as wind. And his ministers are flaming fire. So um, when those are his servants or the people who minister to him or worshippers and so on and he makes them flaming fire boom so we've got this um description of what god does if you like when he gets hold of a human being and appoints them as his messenger and his servant and fills them with his holy spirit he makes them flames of fire combustible influences on the earth awesome verse five he set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. Yeah, this is incredible stuff. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. I'm going to say some things about this as well. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valley sank down the place you, to the place you appointed them. For them, you set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. Now, could this be talking about the flood, the deluge? Could be. Could it be talking about pre-Genesis, before the Garden of Eden? They're apparently, according to the new scientists, they believe now that there's evidence that shows that the earth could well have been covered by seawater. All of it. <laughs> who knew maybe not but it's, they've certainly found some evidence to suggest that certain bits that are high were once underwater and we also know that from geography and stuff at school that the earth's crust has been very mobile and malleable at certain times in the earth's history so when the when we read about the mountains rising up and the valleys sinking down the the geographers and geologists will tell you, yeah, that sort of happened, something like that. And who knows? This is poetry and it's glorious poetry. It's divinely inspired poetry, but it's also fascinating, isn't it? In the context of science to have a look at it and think, what do we know actually about how God could possibly have made the earth? I once asked a friend of mine who's a physicist how <laughs> the, the universe could possibly be squeezed into a, a form the size of a grapefruit in order for the big bang to happen and because according to the laws of thermodynamics as I understand them, limited brain I accept that mass can increase so you it would have to have had the same mass that it has now the whole universe because in, it couldn't possibly increase. And he's, he just looks at me and he says, I don't know, <laughs> which I thought was great. Anyway, sorry, here we go. Right, I'm calming down now. Good morning, Helen. Good morning, Hazel. You lost communication. I'm sorry about that. I cannot accept responsibility for the internet. Um, anyway, so God basically hiked up dry land and pushed back the sea and stored some of it in the polar ice caps and changed it all around and made the dry land and the sea we read in the book of Genesis and I think we probably get a very condensed version of what God did in the story of Genesis yes sorry not <laughs> I'm not responsible for the internet I may cause trouble in some areas but that's not one of them um, righty ho verse 10 so you're gonna have to think about this I can't give you all the answers all I'm doing is throwing stuff out as it as I reflect on these words over the years verse 10 you make springs gush forth in the valleys it's really important that God makes springs gush because seawater kills stuff in in our garden and on the fields it doesn't do the land any good because um, it's too salty. It's great for the sea and it's great for the fish and the seaweed and they like it and they thrive in that environment but the land dwelling creatures don't and so God waters the earth with fresh water. Pretty cool. 
So he says, you make springs gush forth in the valleys and they flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, God, up there somewhere, wherever it is, you water the mountains. The, the rain comes down. So in um, the Middle East particularly, mountains are a real source of life because they attract precipitation from rain and snow, which comes down, flows down the mountainside, gives life to everything it touches. And without the mountains, um, you just have desert because it's so hot. And so the mountains are really, really important. Um, anyway, um, lost my place. But he, verse 13, he says, From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. Nice. It's nice to think of the earth drinking in God's provision of rain and being satisfied, isn't it? So it's called personification, where you make an inanimate thing become alive. And God does that, doesn't he? We know that. Verse 14, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth fruit, food from the earth. This is interesting. God has man and woman, the human race, at the centre of his mind when he creates things. And scientists will also tell you that there is something called the anthropic effect, where the relative positions of the planet to the sun and the earth and the moon and everything else, all these things ha and the size of the earth and all this kind of these important things are exactly tuned to very, very fine tolerances that enable human life to be supported. What a surprise. <laughs> what a coincidence. How useful that is. That's jolly useful. I think God just about got it right there. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Right. Stay focused, Paul. Um, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock, the plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen a man's heart. Now, that's interesting. Just that little verse. God knows that wine makes us cheery and jolly. That was it's in the Bible that it does. So that's OK, as far as I can see. But there is plenty of advice to not take that to extremes and for wine to become our source of, you know, the, our dependency, if you like. So we are only cheerful when we've had wine. I haven't had wine this morning. I haven't even had coffee this morning. And I'm very cheerful because guess what? God loves me. And I know who I am and I know I'm precious to him. And yesterday, I have to say, was a tough day. It was not easy, not even the slightest bit easy at all. And uh, I was glad when it was over. But today, God loves me. It's a new day. We're on an adventure. He never said it was going to be easy, but he did say he'd come with me. Yeah, so here we go. So he's wine... He says he's given us wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, two symbols of the Holy Spirit, incidentally. The anointing makes your face shine, it makes you radiant. The wine of the Spirit gladdens your heart. This is really important, we understand this. And bread to strengthen a man's heart. Bread and, and um, what's the other thing? Um, gluten, getting a bad rap at the moment. Gluten actually is an incredible source of protein. It is a protein and it's very, actually, very accessible and very present in bread so i like bread anyway but the thing is that bread does make your heart strong if it's good bread with decent protein and flour and it, it will make your heart strong because your heart is a muscle it needs protein so that's all right if as long as you're not allergic to it in which case god bless you and that's a tough gig if you are so um but the in in that little verse we've got the holy spirit and the word of god the bread of life jesus himself and it makes our heart strong and the wine gladdens our heart and the oil makes our face shine is a picture isn't it of jesus and the holy spirit all working in unison to anyway there we go right 
Verse 16, the trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for rock badgers. Ever seen a rock badger? Me neither. Um, verse 19, he made the moon to mark, we do have a badger incidentally that comes and empties our waste food bin out the front and we've tried to devise a badger proof um, system but he's clever verse 19 he made the moon to mark the seasons the sun knows it's time for setting and it does doesn't it it changes throughout the seasons but the sun and the earth all just happens it's like a big clock in fact you can tell your time by it oh sorry jack that's tough if gluten's bad for you i i hate that that good things do bad things to some people like some people who can't drink milk i think oh gosh milk it's good but yeah so jack we love you um where are we he made the moon to mark the seasons the sun knows it's time for setting you make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about this is such a cool picture isn't it you make darkness god makes darkness does he wow that's amazing god makes darkness and it's night when all the beasts of the forest creep about the young lions roar for their prey seeking their food from god it's like hold on god the lions are calling it's time to feed them now and you've got this idea there's almost this picture of god the cosmic zookeeper <laughs> there's a one there's a thought to think about um when the sun rises they steal away and lie down in their dens great picture I mean, this is such good poetry man goes out to work and to his labor until the evening typically what we do some people work nights that's tough as well and you have my sympathy if you work nights and i well done well done to all the nhs who work nights and all the lorry drivers who work nights and London Underground and whoever else, God bless you and thank you for working at night. That's tough. O oh Lord, verse 24, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. So God used wisdom when he made the earth. It says, tells us that in Proverbs 8. Um, but the creatures they're his creatures so therefore come on there is a great imperative that we look after this created environment that god's given us that we take care of the creatures that we have within our um within our household if you like and if you're a farmer and you've got a herd of cattle you know how important it is to look after those things if you're looking after sheep or pigs or chickens or whatever it's really really important but the thing to remember because obviously they're your livelihood therefore it's important you keep them well but the thing to remember as well is that they're God's creatures and so when the cow treads on your foot it's God's cow that tro trod on your foot and it's kind of important to be courteous sometimes I'm afraid our little dog I tripped over it about nine times yesterday and I stopped being courteous once or twice. But it's just, it's God's little dog. We need to remember that. Verse 25, here's the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. Awesome. <sighs> it looks flat or it looks wavy and it's reflective. But if you dive under with a scuba mask on, suddenly there's this whole universe under there that you never even knew was there. And the, the sea down at Newton's Cove yesterday apparently was full of fish. And I think they were herring or something like that. I haven't read up on it. Um, amazing. But on the surface of things, very often, it just looks like water. And yet underneath is this whole world. Right. And there go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. Anyone... Want to think a bit about Leviathan? Leviathan pops up a few times in the Bible and appears to be a supersized marine animal of some description. Um, and here it's described as a fun-loving creature that frolics in the sea. 
Job says, don't mess with it. It's not the kind of animal you try to make into a pet for your children. You can't catch it with a hook and tame it. It will eat you. So um, I'd love to think there's still a Leviathan or two out there somewhere which people haven't seen because that makes me really happy when there's sneaky little bits and pieces that nobody knows about still, even on our Earth, on our planet. Anyway, we'll find out, sure enough, I'm, that um, there's a film on there about the Megalodon, this is giant shark, and you kind of think, oh my, <laughs> bad boy. Verse 27, these all look to you to give them their food in season, even Leviathan, funny enough, where we are. Um, when you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they're dismayed. Gosh, we're dismayed when God hides his face and he's hard to find. And um, the living creatures are dismayed when God hides his face. And that would not be a good thing. When you take away their breath, they die and return to, the, to, return to their dust. That's interesting, isn't it? We could say so much. Verse 30, when you send forth your spirit, your ruach, your breath, and it's got a capital S in my Bible, assuming that it's the Holy Spirit here we're talking about. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So even though, if you like, there is a certain inevitability about the little birds laying their eggs and nesting and the eggs hatch and so on and the crow tries to eat them and the crow wants to lay his eggs and blah -de blah and then the badger has a baby or two and foxes have some babies and so on and so on <clears throat> it is actually still a work of god that's in progress and it's to do with him breathing out his spirit and keeping it alive keeping the whole beautiful picture of creation alive verse 31 oh yeah and you renew the face of the ground when when you send forth your spirit they are created and you renew the face of the ground and we love it don't we in the spring when the the ground starts to have a facelift and the grass starts to grow and the trees start to burst out and oh just love it Verse 31, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. So this is this is the psalmist saying, do you know what? At the end of all this, God, I want you to be happy with what you see. But for me, I'm going to praise you as long as I live. I'm going to sing praise to my God while I have my being while I have being. So while I've got breath in me, I'm going to use it to praise the Lord. Verse 34, may my meditation be pleasing to him for I rejoice in the Lord. And there's a good one for us to think about, isn't it? So today, what's my meditate? What am I going to reflect on and meditate on as I go through this day? Am I going to meditate on all the difficulties that I've got and how my nose is too big and how I've put on weight during COVID or all of those things? Or am I just going to meditate on him and how I can just reflect on his goodness and oh his amazing love verse 35 let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more bless the Lord O my soul praise the Lord what a great psalm I think we may have shot over our time but God bless you guys have an amazing day and as you walk around and see the amazing stuff that he's built all around you. Even if you live in a city, you'll see the sky, you'll see things growing. And when I lived in Sheffield, I just loved how green it was up there. And it is a fantastic place. And so just to say, keep enjoying God, enjoying his goodness and giving thanks to him for all that he's done. And have a stunning day. God bless you. Take care.